Hi, my name is Elena. I'm the adult program manager at the Worcester County Library. Um, I also have um, a background in art history, both a bachelor's and master's degree. So today we're going to be talking about scandal and sculpture at the Boston Public Library. Mixing art and libraries, my two favorite things. So from a 21st century perspective, the uproar that ensued in Boston around Frederick William McMoney's 1894 sculpture, Bacante and Infant Fawn, it's difficult to imagine. A nude woman in exuberant motion juts her left knee upwards as she poses on her right toes. She holds grapes in her outstretched right arm, and in the bend of her left elbow, she holds the infant fawn, who stares longingly towards the fruit. Gifted by the artist to Charles F. McCann, celebrated architect of the Boston Public Library, the statue was then donated by McKim and approved by the library trustees as a centerpiece for the courtyard and a tribute to McKim's late wife. This sculpture stirred such a negative outcry but that, that by 1897 it was removed. Opponents of the figure reacted with denunciations such as, quote, debauched, vice-ridden, a memorial to reckless abandon, and the worst type of harlotry, end quote. For over a year, controversy, controversy brewed as opponents sought to expel the sculpture and proponents expressed equal vehemence that it remain. One opponent attending a public talk titled Treason at the Boston Public Library accused the trustees of, quote, treason to purity and sobriety and virtue and almighty God, end quote. On the other hand, American artists such as Daniel Chester French and Augustus Sam Gaudens applauded his work. American art critic Royal Cortezos offered his praise when he declared, quote, it is deft, compact, a little triumph of, con of concision, yet it has all the expansive grace, all the intimations of endless movement, which belong to a dancing figure, end quote. What was the cause of these remarks in the fall of 1896? This discussion will begin with a visual examination of the sculpture, move on to a comparison with another 19th century work, explore the mythological stories behind each, and end with a look at the social and civic climate within Boston as a means of further understanding the outrage. McMoney studied in Paris under the Beaux Arts style, a style more elegant, naturalistic, and decorative. To see an example of this style, look at the main buildings on Ellis Island. The, di the idealized forms of earlier 19th century art were beginning to fade, and his work rests within a larger framework of bronze mythological figures. <clears throat> he was renowned for his Barge of State Fountain, the centerpiece of the Chicago's World Fair of 1893. Here we see Columbia sitting atop the barge, heralded by fame at the prow, oared by the arts, so we have music, architecture, sculpture, and painting. And on the other side, we have industries, um, agriculture, science, industry, and, com and commerce. And in the back, this is time guiding the barge. His work was met with critical acclaim at the Paris Salon, and his Diana earned him an honorable mention at the same salon in 1889. Here, the Roman goddess is represented as a huntress wearing a crescent moon hairpiece. She balances athletically on one foot, having just released an arrow and the bow in her left hand. McMoney's model Diana not as a perfect classical goddess, but as an agile young woman, her face and body revealing the naturalism. So in other words, he's not going for a perfect ideal here. Bacante, an infant fawn, depicts a woman, so specifically a follower of the Greek wine god Dionysus, with a joyous and potentially intoxicated countenance. Gazing at the fruit cluster in a longing manner, the child reaches out to them as if wishing to partake in their sweetness. The Bacante's hair pulls up into a bun, mildly disheveled in appearance. The woman wears an inviting expression that encourages the external world to join in her gaiety. Movement presents itself in the lifted leg, while the poised toes suggest a frolicking figure. 
Curved lines create an exuberant gesture that forces the viewer to follow their motion. It displays a character interacting with the outside space. The uplifted knee and outstretched arms help forge a circular mobility that encourages the viewer to follow these arced configurations. In other words, if you were in front of the statue and there is a copy at the Baltimore Museum of Art, you would want to walk around it. It's a sculpture in the round. 19th century sculpture was largely idealized, romanticized, and portrayed in marble statues. These pieces took inspiration from literature, mythology, history, and the Bible. Those are the big four accepted French salon, European salon subject matters of the time. Women were mainly depicted as nude, passive, and vulnerable. Sculptures of this type also established for the elite of America a means of public education that would enlighten and uplift a society that stressed values, discipline, and knowledge. William Henry Reinhardt's Clyde from 1872 serves an ex as an example of this type of sculpture while also serving as a point of comparison with the Picante. Clady was a sea nymph, sea nymph who loved the sun god Apollo, though he shunned her affections. In her grief, she stood watching the sun for nine days and nights without food or water. The gods took pity on her and turned her into a sunflower so she could watch her love forever. Apollo is the god of light and measure, opposite in characteristics to the wine god Dionysus. He represents the rational, measured, and balance. To know oneself would be a way to sum up the Apollonian school of thought, which was internal and introspective. Clyde is a nude standing in a graceful manner with a downward gaze of sadness. Holding a wilted sunflower in her hand and supported by a stump covered in the same flower, she is smooth, made of marble, has an elongated body, and is idealized in depiction. A look of perfection comprises her flawless facial features, while her hair denotes a simple pattern. The figure's eyes look thoughtful and introspective, not inviting to the outside world. Her pose, graceful and still, depicts her sorrow while she focuses on her grief. Vertical and static lines express a subdued feeling, and downward glancing eyes continue the mood. Movement is not transmitted either through line or pose, and the tree stump contributes to the rigid feeling of the sculpture. I will add that she is in a contraposto stance, which was the ancient way of conveying, I won't go so far as to say motion, but it makes it a little bit more dynamic. Um, and a contraposto just means counterbalance or counterweight. Moving on, Picante, not an idealized form, shows its texture and the hand of the artist in its bronze medium. The Picante radiates joy and pleasure in a confronting manner. She looks up with an expression of ecstasy without shame. In Clyde, nudity was inconsequential, leading one to believe that deeper problems existed because of the Picante's pleasure and inebriation. Many of those against the statue admitted that her lack of clothing did not embody their misgivings. Instead, her vices stood as the main issue of outcry. Stemming from mythology, this narrative work renders a follower of the wine god Dionysus. He was the son of Zeus and the mortal Semele. Enraged over Zeus's affair, Hera tricked Semele into asking Zeus to reveal his true form, knowing this would kill Semele instantly. Still inside the womb when she died, Dionysus completed his gestation period in the thigh of his father and then was raised by nymphs. Ancient playwright Euripides tells the most famous account of this deity in his work, The Bacchae, from circa 405 BCE. The mystery cult followers, excuse me, as mystery cult followers, the Bacchante would become intoxicated within their rituals. Loss of logic and the removal of restraints to note key attributes. An interpretation of this mythology depicts a group that was drunk, theatrical, and interactive with the external world. Women comprised the regular followers of this cult, and as part of their worship, they would run into the mountains in a frenzied state to participate in sexual acts and devour raw meat from animals that had been torn limb from limb. 
In Euripides' drama, Dionysus returns to his mother's homeland of Thebes, where his cousin Pentheus resides as king, returning to, to punish the women of Thebes for not recognizing that he was a god and born of a god, he finds opposition from Pentheus, who forbids any worship of Dionysus. Unable to stop the women, including his mother Agave, and even the older statesmen, Pentheus meets with a tragic ending. Lured into the woods, he is killed by the Bacante and mutilated by his mother. Echoing the outcry towards the sculpture, Pentheus speaks regarding the cult worshippers when he says, quote, this brings it close, like a spreading fire, this bacchic menace. We are disgraced in the eyes of Hellas. There must be no delay. Go to the electron gates, order all hoplites and all the riders of swift horses to muster, all those who brandish targes and those whose hands twang the bowstring. We shall march against the Bacchants. This has truly gone too far, end quote. Not as far as it's gonna go from his perspective at that point. In Boston, a parallel presents itself in a more recent and non-mythological revolt against the Bacante. Rejected on moral and religious grounds, this piece, placed in the courtyard of Boston's public library, also demonstrates that civic reasons revealed a denouncing of the piece as, quote, inebriate and blatantly licentious, end quote. Boston became ridiculed by many cities of the time for being too prudish and prim. As the New York Sun stated, quote, the people there in Boston do not believe that such trifling with the terrible gravity of life as the Bacante delighted in is proper. They don't do it themselves and they object to anybody's doing it or having done it, end quote. Here's another connection with Euripides', Euripides play. Pentheus too sought to prevent sexual escapades and open intoxication. There is more into the story than an upright and uptight and overly moral puritanical society in Boston of the time. Issues around civil control and use of public space were paramount in the 19th century. Nudity and sobriety were not the crux of this outrage, but rather a race to claims of social legitimacy. A deep anxiety existed relating to changing identities and shifting hierarchies within the city. Leading this op opposition were the religious organizations comprised of middle and upper class citizens and important members of Boston's Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite. Concerned with the changing roles and hierarchies within the city, they feared the statue would incite social anarchy in addition to damaging their political power. More specifically, opponents saw it as, quote, a challenge to a moral and social hierarchy, quote, that shored up their waning political power. At its root, the controversy tapped into the idea of whose civic values would shape public life. This trepidation caused them to vehemently attack the peace. Foremost in this assault were prominent Boston figures, among them Harvard President Charles W. Eliot, Harvard professors and critics Barrett Wendell and Charles Eliot Norton, and Judge Robert Grant. Impeccable examples of social status all these men comprised Boston Brahmins, Anglo-Saxon Protestants that had sustained themselves over generations through old money, family ties, and involvement in several cultural and political organizations in the city. They shared with associations such as the Religious Watch and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the belief that art's impact on a person was extremely influential over behavior. Installed in a public building, Bacante would reach a wide audience, including people considered uncultured and therefore most dangerous. Also, by placing this statue in a public space, McKim and the library trustees unwittingly pushed the Bacante into the center of debates at the time, including women's roles, the position of an Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite, and the proper nature of leisure activities. Bacante inadvertently played a role in the struggles of competing classes and ethnic groups vying for social and political expression. By the late 19th century, public libraries represented an instrument of social reform and members of the public library movement began, begun in 1876, looked to this venue as a potential solution to social problems such as alcoholism, poverty, and the assimilation of diverse ethnic groups. 
Libraries were stocked with good reading materials and fine art for self-improvement and the creation of better, more responsible citizens. Though this might sound like the community hub of today's library, for the Boston Brahmin, the quote, public in public institution did not imply an open place to congregate or bring together different groups. What, matters mo what mattered most to them was, quote, absorbing prescribed communal values, in this case, determined by a political and social elite, end quote. As sociologist Paul DiMaggio has written, quote, Boston leaders retreated from the public sector to found a system of nonprofit organizations that permitted them to maintain some control over the community, even as they lost their command of its political institutions, end quote. Both the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and the Boston Symphony were founded in this period, and although the public library helped to consolidate elite social structures, it especially reached out to a lower class constituency. Another example of an artwork rests inside the Grand Staircase at the, at the Boston Public Library. Here we see Siobhan's chemistry from 1896. Unlike the lighthearted Bacante, this painting fit with the cultural notions of Victorian behavior. This partially nude figure of chemistry shows a traditional and acceptable display of the female form, nudity cloaked by allegorical context. She stands waving a wand over elements, creating mysterious change as spirits look, look on. An image of civilized society, she represents rational, scientific endeavor and humankind's effort to domesticate natural forces. The solid, column-like, and balanced form of the figure underscores that control. Posing the largest perceived threat to the Brahmin lifestyle were the Irish, who were in immigrating in vast numbers to Boston. Inappropriate characteristics perceived in the statue extended to their fear of lower class and immigrant absorption in society and potential reversal of the city's social structure. Magazines such as Atlantic Monthly and Century circulated reports about the degeneracy of second generation immigrants. Catholic and culturally distinct, the Irish began arriving in Boston in, in the 1840s. By 1895, estimates put the Irish population at about 60%. The upper class focused on their poverty and felt that they were incapable of being productive, even though, or maybe because, of the Irish increasing their electoral strength by politically challenging Boston's upper class. For example, in 1884, an Irishman became mayor for the first time. This political battle caused many of the elite to think their values were under attack by an alien people. To make matters worse, a drunken stereotype adhered to this group. Saloons were a thorn to the upper class and alcohol was considered a scourge. These factors did not assist the Bacante controversy, but rather inflamed the situation. Placing this immoral statue in a public venue essentially meant the same as installing a saloon in the courtyard both would oppose Christian sensibilities. As the New York Times reported, the Reverend J. Boyd Brady in a sermon asked, quote, where is the man worthy of the name American and Christian who is willing to set up before eyes of youth a statue sacred to immodesty and obscenity? Where is the woman, the mother, the daughter who wants a statue in this fair city of humanities dedicated to the seducer, the libertine, the harlot, the pimp, the pander, and the bawd? away with the horrid thing and bury it in the bay, end quote. Two cartoons of the time serve as examples of middle and upper class concerns. In A Suggestion for a Pedestal for the Bacante, a Boston newspaper cartoon, one notices the statue atop categories types of alcohol. This work suggests how its placement in a public space tapped into class and ethnic problems. Within the visual hierarchy, one notes the placement of hard alcohol in the bottom with Irish whiskey in the middle barrel. The next tier displays books, including Vintner's Guide to the Art of Brewing, suggesting a refined middle-class taste. Though ambiguous toward the Bacante, by placing her on the top tier suggests the marriage of art and taste that would be up to the upper-class elite to interpret. 
The climate of 1896 saw labor unrest and recession in addition to populist movements. The upper class feared that a public sculpture officially sanctioned and breaking convention would encourage civic disorder. And another cartoon, Bacanti's skip will be the rage, the lame, the halt, and the blind will make this their fad now that the statue has been accepted, offers an illustration of the potential chaos that could arise from viewing this wanton statue. The Bacanti appears crudely drawn in the left background. Well, in the front, we notice varying citizens of Boston imitating her pose. Even the animal kingdom participates in the possible anarchy as seen in the little dog. The visual encapsulates the fears of the upper class, namely unrest that would bring about the elite's demise. By establishing themselves as purveyors of good taste, Boston's wealthy marked cultural ground, and while they viewed artistic merit within the Bacante, they also felt it failed to uplift and edify. Not all of Boston shared these views. Much of the population found the sculpture acceptable. The Boston transcript noted that the crowd sighed disappointedly and one angry person exclaimed, quote, why, I don't see anything so bad about that. She isn't drunk, end quote. President of the library trustees called the piece, quote, simply glorious, a beautiful work of art adding, there wasn't anybody who objected to it except for Professor Charles Elliot Norton, and he objects to a great many beautiful things, end quote. A large body of praise exists, but it was not enough to win the battle against the powerful elite. Donated and then removed by McKim, Bacante found a home at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where curators provided a prominent place in the Great Hall of the Museum, which opened in 1902. Bacanti shocked the sensibilities of Boston's upper crust society, but not the majority of the population. A group of powerful Brahmins and religious sects found victory in the expulsion of this joyous statue. They felt this artwork would incite civic disorder and reckless abandon, especially since it was placed in a public space. A war was waged not against a sculpture, but the fear of a changing political climate threatening their power. As with Pentheus, they too met their end, albeit under less traumatic circumstances. By the end of the 19th century, aristocratic dominance was lost to mass politics and variances in cultural heirs. Almost 100 years later, the statue was reinstalled in the courtyard in 1992, though it is a cast of the original. Perceptions of public space altered and the people of Boston corrected a past error. I would just like to end this by saying that the original is still at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and that we still have debates about public sculpture today and who gets to decide if the sculpture goes there or what piece of art goes where. Um, here are my resources and I thank you for listening.